You know what I love? Adapters. It could be anything, like a little M.2 card that turns a potentially useless Wi-Fi slot into a couple of SATA ports, or a PCIe card that gives you faster networking, or maybe a PoE splitter that lets you easily power non-PoE devices. I love the idea of just a simple adapter turning an older or underpowered system into something much more useful. Sometimes though, adapters can get, well, pretty goofy. Regardless though, using them still sort of tickles that little spot in my brain that just likes to tinker with stuff, and well, it seems like a lot of you guys like the same stuff I do. So I thought it might be fun to take a look at a handful of odd adapters I've come across and see just how goofy they really are and whether or not they might actually be useful. So let's get started. We're going to start off with something a bit on the mild side. It's not too wacky or anything, and I think it could be moderately useful. I made a video like two years ago on the M.2 Iki slot, which is commonly used for Wi-Fi cards. I talked about how it's often overlooked, and many of those slots support at least one lane of PCIe and can therefore be used to add 25 gig networking or some SATA ports. You could even use it to add an extra NVMe SSD, albeit with the limitation of just one lane of PCIe bandwidth. One thing I've wished for for a while now is just an actual E-key NVMe SSD that doesn't require an adapter. A lot of times those E-key slots are in places where it could be pretty tough to try to fit an adapter, and even if you do get one to fit, it might block one of the other M.2 sockets. And yeah, well, I still don't think that exists, sadly, but if you do want to add some more storage in probably the most compact way possible, you could use something like this, which is just an adapter for a little micro SD card slot. Now, obviously there are some major downsides to using something like this versus just like an NVMe SSD. First of all, this actually uses the USB protocol, not PCIe, which could introduce some potential stability issues compared to PCIe or SATA. But it also means that this should be compatible with pretty much any E-key slot out there as, well, at least as far as I believe, they're all going to be wired up for USB, that way they can support Bluetooth. But uh, yeah, that's USB 2, not 3, which means we're going to be stuck with a pretty slow 50 megabytes per second or so. Now, USB isn't the only issue here. We are also stuck using SD cards, which aren't nearly as durable as NVMe or SATA SSDs. Now, you might be able to overcome some of the durability issues by buying SD cards that are designed for higher write endurance, but you're definitely still going to run into the issue of these failing over time. That being said, if your options are having an SD card for extra storage or not having any extra storage at all, this might be a decent option. Like I mentioned earlier, sometimes E-key slots can be very space constrained. A great example of this is this little upsquared 6000 single board computer I covered in my last video. Here the E-key slot is under the M-key slot, a layout I've come across many times. Even if you do manage to find something like an E to M key adapter that fits, well, the results are probably going to be sketchy at best. But this little micro SD card adapter fits perfectly, and now I have an extra 128GB drive that I can use. With the USB 2 limitation, I probably wouldn't use this as a boot drive for a desktop system, but just to see how it would do, I installed Debian 13. It took a bit longer to install than normal, and the performance wasn't great, but yeah, it technically worked. I still wouldn't recommend this though but this could work as a boot drive for something a bit more lightweight, like for example, an Open Media Vault NAS running the flash memory plugin. Now it would be tough to fit it on a little card like this, but I wish I could have found a dual slot version. That way you could have two SD cards and install your boot drive in a mirror or something. I did find versions of these for a B key adapter as well as a mini PCIe adapter, but well, with those two form factors, you typically have a bit more space. So you're probably better off trying to figure out SATA or NVMe adapters but you don't have to just use this for a boot drive. You could run a bootloader on this, for example, if you're trying to boot over PCIe on an older BIOS that doesn't support it. Or it could just be nice to have a little bit of extra storage in your system. And once again, unlike a lot of other useful adapters, this doesn't get in the way of other things. Like for example, on this single board computer, you could still fit something in this M key slot, like this five gigabit network adapter. This isn't an adapter I planned to cover in this video in detail. It's, it's pretty straightforward, so this is more of an honorable mention. Now, obviously with five gigabit, you have to have networking that supports it, but with this, you can get half the bandwidth of a 10 gig adapter for a minuscule fraction of the cost, which that seems like a pretty great value to me. Now, you know what else is a great value? This video sponsor, Private Internet Access. As many of you know, a VPN could be a really useful tool, and I'm sure many of you, like me, also host your own VPN servers. 
but PIA not only gives you access to servers across 91 different countries, it also works really great as a backup. In fact, just the other day I was working from a coffee shop and using my VPN while I was on their public Wi-Fi. All of a sudden my ISP started acting up and I was able to switch over to PIA with no issues. I've been using PIA personally for almost two years now I think, and it's been absolutely rock solid. I love that I can use it on all my devices, even my laptop which is running Fedora. I also use PIA in my home lab. I have it set up as the VPN provider for a Docker container called Gluten, which lets you easily and automatically tunnel a bunch of other containers through PIA's servers. And I also appreciate that PIA has a strict no logs policy that's been verified by multiple third party audits. So if you're looking for a reliable, feature rich, yet affordable VPN service, then make sure to check out PIA by using my link in the description. That'll get you 83% off, plus an extra four months completely free. All right, next up we have this, which, well, it might just look like a pretty standard quad gigabit PCIe adapter. But if that's the case, where's the PCIe part? Well, this actually connects to another M.2 M or B key adapter via this mess of cables. Now, the benefits here are pretty self-explanatory. You hook up this adapter to an M.2 socket and connect it to this, and boom, you have four gigabit ethernet ports. This could be perfect for building a little DIY router, or maybe a hypervisor where you wanna have multiple physical network connections. Now, the main downside of this adapter though is, well, mine just didn't work, and I have my suspicions about why that is. I plugged this in, but I couldn't get it working at all. I also noticed that it was getting pretty hot, and then I found that the heatsink was actually just falling off and didn't have enough like thermal paste to actually make contact with the little controller chip here. And I tried replacing it with my own thermal pad to try to see if I could get it working, but well, it got really hot and I think it might have accidentally cooked itself. Uh, at least that's my best guess, or I just got a crappy one of these, or it's just a crappy product. I'm not really sure. I missed the return window and didn't want to shell out another $50 to find out, so sadly, uh, we'll just never really know about this guy. This next adapter does work though, I promise. And once again, this probably looks a little bit deceptive at first. You might just think, yeah, sure, it's a little two and a half gig PCIe card, big whoop. But you might have also noticed this little SATA power connector on the back. And well, that's because this card also provides PoE. Now, if you're confused, don't worry, I was too. In fact, it took me a second to even determine which direction we were talking about here. But as it turns out, this can supply PoE Plus to devices on the other end of this network interface. Now, I'm sure many of you are familiar, but PoE, or power over ethernet, is typically a feature of network switches. It's most commonly used to power devices like security cameras, wireless access points, or other small network switches, and it can even be used to power some smaller systems like Raspberry Pis. But like I said, this is typically provided by a network switch where multiple devices can connect to, well, the network, not just a single interface on one system. Before trying to figure out what this might actually be used for, I wanted to see it in action. I needed a PCIe slot, so I brought out an old friend of the channel, my HP ProDesk G3. I got the card plugged into the PCIe slot, and the little SATA power cable just barely reached the connector on the card. I didn't have an access point or camera on hand, so I just used another little adapter I found to be very useful, which is this little 12 volt PoE splitter. It just breaks out into ethernet and a little barrel jack so that you can power things like, for example, this up squared board from earlier. And sure enough, it worked just as expected. The little board powered on and we have a working two and a half gig connection. Now maybe you guys have some good ideas or reasons why you'd want to use this. I think the best I could come up with in my head was if someone, for example, wanted to build a DIY router in a system like this HP ProDesk. Maybe they already had a network switch that didn't have PoE and the only device that they wanted to run over PoE was maybe like a single access point. Then you could plug this into your router, power up that one access point, and there you go. However, for the price of this thing, well, it seems like it might just be a better option to just buy a cheap PoE switch, but I don't know, maybe I'm missing something here. If so, let me know down in the comments. I'm very curious on what you might actually do with something like this little guy. Now, the last adapter on the list for today is probably the weirdest in my opinion, but it's also something that, in the right circumstances, and assuming it works, might actually be the most beneficial. If you've ever worked around in some small systems, you'll know that it's pretty common for them to have room for a single two and a half inch SATA SSD. But what if rather than one SSD, you really want two? This little thing here takes up the physical dimensions of a standard two and a half inch drive, and even has the standard SATA connections for data and power as well. But it's actually a little RAID controller that supports two M.2 SSDs. However, I should mention and clarify that these are M.2 SATA SSDs, not NVMe. 
That's fine for me though, because over time, as I've recycled systems and stuff, I've accumulated quite a few of these little M.2 SATA drives that, well, typically I have no good use for. With this adapter, I can convert two of these little 256 gig SSDs into a little array, even if the system I'm using only has room for one two and a half inch drive and only has a single SATA port. This supports a few different configurations like RAID 0, RAID 1, or a span, but I was most interested in the JBot mode, which should present each SSD as an individual disk. I followed the instructions to set the controller to JBOD mode and removed two of the jumpers to only leave pins five and six shorted. After that, I shorted the set pin to ground, powered the card on and off, and then returned the set pin back. Then I booted up the system and, well, sadly only one of the two drives showed up, and I sort of expected this. For the JBOD functionality to work, the SATA controller that this adapter is hooked up to has to support port multiple. has to for the JBOD functionality to work, the SATA controller that this adapter is hooked up to has to support port multiplication, which typically most integrated controllers on systems like this one don't. The good news is that many of the SATA controllers on external cards like this little M.2 adapter that I mentioned earlier, or this PCIe card, do support port ugh, do support port multiplication. Why did I write that? Do support port multiplication. And after switching the adapter over to the other SATA controller, it worked as expected and both drives showed up. Now, depending on the setup, having to add in a SATA controller just to be able to use this little adapter might sort of defeat the purpose of using this adapter, but you could decide to use hardware RAID instead. I went back through the configuration process, but this time I added another jumper to also short pins one and two. This wiped the two drives and created a RAID 1 array, or just a mirror. With this, the array was just presented to the operating system as a single drive, and I was able to set up a partition and file system, then write something to the file system, remove one of the drives to simulate a drive failure, and sure enough, I could still access my data. Then I replaced that drive, which caused one of the activity LEDs to slowly blink. This is the signal that the controller was rebuilding the data on that drive to repair the array. Now there are definitely some downsides in 2025 to using hardware RAID over something like ZFS. One of which is that it's much more difficult to know if you've actually had a drive failure. There are those little activity LEDs on the adapter that'll blink if there's a failure, but well, those are likely to be hidden away. I tried using Smartmon tools after removing one of the drives to see if I could find any kind of warning or something, but I didn't have any luck. Now, to be clear, I have like no experience with hardware RAID controllers, so I might be missing something obvious, but to my understanding, there's not really a good way in the software to tell if you've had a drive failure, so that could lead to some issues. If I'm wrong here, definitely let me know down in the comments. But the RAID functionality or port multiplication issues probably aren't the biggest issue. Uh, that's going to be the price because, well, for an adapter that you're probably putting into an old system and using old cheap SSDs for, $50 is pretty steep. Regardless of the price or usefulness of any of these, I still just find them to be so dang interesting. There's definitely a reason these adapters aren't more popular, they're niche for sure, but that also means that they might be exactly what someone needs in a weird or specific situation. And I wouldn't be surprised if a few of these pop up in some future projects or videos. And I wanna be clear, I'm not done. I need, I need more of these weird adapters that I've never come across. So drop your ideas down in the comments. Or if you need to share a link, you can also email me at info at hardwarehaven.media and just put goofy adapters in the subject field. I have a feeling I'm going to want to do a Goofy Adapters Part 2. In fact, I actually found all of these on Amazon. I didn't even dig into AliExpress yet, and I can only imagine what chaos is waiting for me over there. That's about it for this one though, so as always, thank you guys so much for watching, stay curious, and I really can't wait to see you in the next one.